Hello, camp followers. This is episode three with the lovely Mary Ellen Goldberg, who we are very, very lucky to have join us. We are discussing a very difficult topic. We've done a couple of episodes already, and we're now on to the topic of the actual event of euthanasia. Um, this is something that is a very difficult area to talk about, but we feel really strongly that you guys need to have more information out there about what to expect. And hopefully with that, they, we can decrease some of the worry, the concern, and make it a lot more manageable for you. So, Mary, thank you for joining us. I'm going to let you leave. Very try good. And help, try and help owners understand what actually happens, what we try, the gold standard that we try to aspire to. Um, take it away. Very good. Um, the first thing that I want to let you know is you've probably, before this particular day, had a pre-euthanasia visit, visit or spoken with your veterinarian to talk about things that are going to happen. The actual day when you come in, you will be led with your pet to a quiet room that is you alone will be there with the nurse or something like that and it's going to be a calm peaceful area so hopefully there's not going to be a lot of excitement going on outside uh, since it since it is a solemn event and this is not something trivial this is something that is is deeply disturbing to you as the owner. So on that particular day, when the veterinarian enters or whoever is going to do the procedure, the first thing they're going to probably suggest is let you have some time with your pet, let you be there, and you at this time will get to decide finally whether you want to be in the room or not. When it occurs, I always like to have some type of pre-anesthetic or sedative on board for the pet so that they basically are going to go to sleep or be in a sleep-like state and not get excited or anxious or upset. Mm -hmm. And so the owner really can be there with their animal while the patient is going to that area where they are in a sleep-like state. Mm -hmm. Once that occurs, if the owner chooses to stay, the veterinarian is going to draw up a barbiturate drug that will stop the heart and respiration. Mm -hmm. They need to let the owner that this is what is going to occur. Mm -hmm. If the animal is not moving and if it's a typical euthanasia, then the medication is injected intravenously mm -hmm. so that the owner should know that. And there may be someone helping the veterinarian or nurse, whoever is actually performing the procedure, so that they can help with holding off a vein. Maybe the owner is skilled enough that they can do that themselves. Mm -hmm. They can participate as much as they want or as little as they want. And if they choose at that time to leave the room, nobody is making any kind of judgment. No one's going to on judge them. No. no one. Because we can understand how upsetting this is for you as well as for your pet. Mm -hmm. So when this happens, I should say we spoke a little bit about it. But prior to getting in that room, a consent form will have been signed yes. Yes. so that this is possible, legal, and there won't be ramifications for anyone yeah. with this going on. Um, 
the owner will have been made aware that once the, the intravenous drug is injected, it is very quick, it's very quick. within 10, 15 seconds. Um, there's no going back once this drug has been injected. This is final. So you can't say, well, I've changed my mind. No. You could at the sedative point or the pre-anesthetic point. Um, I doubt seriously that many people would because they would have reached this place in their mind. It's a very long time to get there, you know, and you're right. Once, once we're doing it, and that's why the prep is so important. And if that takes weekly chats, daily chats, you know, the nursing team, the veterinary team are there for that person. Because as you say, it's the most awful feeling. I, I, oof, oof, we have to be careful because I'll burst into tears because it also, I think everybody has to re remember the, the emotions and the sight and what you experience stays with you. And, you know, it's, it's so traumatic. But the veterinary professional has the ability to really, really make it quite a peaceful, beautiful, calm event. And when I look back on my experiences, I've done thousands, you know, because I've been a vet now for 18 years. But for my dog, for my dog, it was peaceful. She was pre-sedated. She had a catheter. She was ready. I'm going to cry. I have to stop. Um, it, was, it, was, it was as good as it could be, but it was me that didn't deal with it. And that's, I think, something that people have to do that last deed. See, I'm getting tearful. You have to do the last deed where what you feel has to be put in a pocket for those minutes. Put your emotions in your pocket keep it together and let it go smoothly because it is a beautiful gift that you can give, isn't it? For me, it was the best thing that I could have done. And I think we, God, I do get tearful. It's awful. Um, we have to try and make sure it's as, as pleasant, as calm and kind and something that isn't going to haunt people. It's so, let me ask you, Hannah, mm -hmm. how many years ago was Holly? Did you? Oh, it? it was only December. See, this is bad. Oh, this. Oh, yeah. so this so is. I had, I had so been see, for 16 years. So see, what I guess basically I'm trying to say to you is you're still in that grief period. Oh, this is, this is, this is relatively new. So, I mean, for you. So, mm. this is not something to be apologizing for. This I think I'll still be doing this in 10 years. <laughs> because it, I've been it seven years before it even happened. So, right. I think um, I have a lot of empathy for owners because I know how horrible it, it feels. But I also, I'm quite proud of myself in that for me, that moment of looking after that animal, I feel like I try and go into hyperdrive because it's imperatively important that it's done beautifully. And, you know, for me as a vet, I want to make sure that the owner is okay, whoever else is in the room is okay. I want everything to be prepared. I do things like I hide the euthanasia drug away from the owner's vision so that they don't see it, you know, because otherwise that could stay in the head. I try and make sure that there is not a clinical environment. I very discreetly get the consent form done and then I take it away because in case that owner is looking at that consent form going, I'm, I'm consenting, I'm consenting. I do put a lot of thought into trying to just make sure that I understand I'm going to take these emotions away with them. It's still hard. It's, ex it's extremely hard. Mm. And think about when you say it's a gift think and it is think about untold suffering mm -hmm. suffering from the standpoint of i'm not the same as i used to be um i cannot do what i used to do i'm not enjoying anything anymore i am existing 
Yeah. And this is why it is a gift. The thing is, people will disagree with us. I know I worked with a vet for a period of time that really didn't believe in euthanasia. And there are cultures and there are people that that don't see it like that. They, they feel very strongly that Mother Nature or God or whatever they believe in will choose when that animal departs or they relate their animal to a human counterpart who we are not allowed, or certainly not in our country, to perform these acts. So I do respect that, but for me, in my opinion, I feel it is a gift. And um, I think it has the ability to help that owner and help that animal end their relationship in the most peaceful manner. Just going back to the actual event, because I think this is quite important. People know this is the gritty stuff. Okay. Some vets will do it off a needle. Some will do it via catheter. I prefer a catheter. I prefer yes. the in place. Um, but there are people that are very gifted with their venipuncture and they can hit a vein spot on first time and they've been doing it for the last 20 years, what we would term off the needle. Um, that is still recognized as an acceptable way. Most people will go for the cephalic, which is a, a vein on the forelimb. Um, sometimes I've done the cephenus, which is the, a back leg vein, so that the owner can be at the front with, with their dog. There are other entry points, aren't there? So I was going to let you just talk about a few of them, just so owners could be prepared. These are not common, but they do happen. So I'll leave you to do that bit. So as I told you, since it's an intravenous drug, this is something that is quick. And what I wanted to let owners know is I went to work at a veterinary hospital when I was in high school to, to learn. I, I didn't have any qualification. It was prior to going to college or school. But I was allowed to work at a veterinary hospital. And the first time I saw a euthanasia, my mouth dropped open. An yeah. owner was not present. I was there, but I'd never seen it before. So for someone that worked with animals, to have it be so fast, and that's something that I think owners need to understand. The animal, what I prefer is sedated and they go to sleep. And saying the word go to sleep, they are dying. Yeah. But they actually just go to sleep and have no knowledge of what happens. Now I can move on to other areas. You are talking about the cephalic vein or the saphenous vein in a back leg are the common things. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that other areas, so when would you use another area that I'm going to mention? I went in to euthanize an old, um, I believe it was a, a miniature pincher. So this is a little tiny dog. And the veins, all the veins from its sickness or illness, and I'm honestly, I don't remember what it was, but all the veins had collapsed. Mm -hmm. So they weren't, uh, you, I couldn't place a catheter, I couldn't do anything. So here are some alternative sites that owners should be aware of and the veterinarian would tell you immediately they would they if would it was going to have to be an alternative site. Intrahepatic. So yeah. that's going into your, the animal's liver. Yeah. That will euthanize them because it goes immediately into the venous system and to the heart. Intrarenal. Yeah. That same way it will go in it will make it quickly not as quickly as iv but it will make it to the heart intraperitoneal mm. this is what i utilized on the miniature pincher and mm. i actually had it with my own cat yeah. because my cat did not have 
good veins. Yeah. And what happened, the medication is given IP. It takes about 15 minutes. Yeah. The animal is asleep and basically the systems, it just takes time for the medication to stop the heart and respiration. We but use I, that a lot still for small mammals. So I, I, sat, I sat in a chair with my cat mm. and petted her yeah. until she was gone. Yeah. And in the same way, other areas that I have only used in an emergency situation and never with an owner present, intracardiac, that's yeah. going directly into the heart. Yeah. I think it is, the animal is asleep, they would not know it, but that might, that might be too much for an owner. I think so, and over here in the UK, I think it would be really, really uncommon for an owner to experience anything bar intravenous. And I know as a vet, when I've been in the situation that the animal's very collapsed, I tend to suggest to the owner, please say your goodbyes, what I'm about to do might not be what you want to remember. And I always make sure that the animal has no ability to experience what I am about to do. So with rabbits and guinea pigs and you know the small mammals, trying to hit a vein in that situation is very difficult. So we commonly sedate them or we use an inhalational gaseous anesthesia, so the uh, gas, um, and they then go to sleep and they, they have no experience. Just because we could talk about this for a long time, what happens immediately after that we need to prep the owners for? So the, the, the drug... Yes. So, so this is, is always difficult because you can't, you can't spend too much tell time telling them about this before the event because it, it, it would shock. It's too horrific to take in yeah. immediately. Yeah. And when I say horrific, this is what happens next is very natural. Yeah. It, it normally happens. It is not something that has gone wrong. But if you're not prepared for it, you might be shocked. Yeah. So what happens is, all right, the anal sphincter completely relaxes and so does the urine, any urinary sphincters so that the animal may urinate and defecate yeah. immediately after you would not, the, the veterinary staff or veterinarian would make sure that things were in place to clean immediately. But as an owner, their shock. mouth might hang open and say, I didn't know that was going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And so this is a natural body process. Believe it or not, it happens with people too. Yeah. You know, it, it's so, terrifying, isn't it? Yes, but it does happen. And I'm not talking about people that are euthanized. I'm talking yeah. about just when they die. This yes. is what happens. So um, those are some things that I think definitely an owner needs to be aware of. The breathing, I think that's the one that I always, you would love to tell everybody, this might happen, that might happen. And I'd probably say in my experience, 50 to 60% something happens. It might be the tail lifts and the passage of feces. It might be the dog goes straight and the legs, you know, extend. It might be that the neck kind of elevates. It might be we get some what's called chain stoking where you just get a breath a breath or the mouth might open um, things like that we don't want to say beforehand because we don't you know it's already a very emotionally calm and I don't want to break the, the, the lovely environment I've created um, another thing to remember is that eyes don't close I think that's something that I've heard so many times is why is his eyes still open they don't um, but generally the whole procedure if it goes according to plan, which I'd say 75 to 80% of the cases in my experience have done, 
it's it's done and dusted within 10 to 15 seconds it's it's oh yes and and, and i then for me after that once i make sure all of the bodily functions are calmed down so i make sure that there is no heartbeat and that will be by checking pulse and listening to chest no respiratory movement um, i make sure those functions have stopped i tend to say to people i'm going to leave you to have time but you might see a muscle fasciculation you might see a skin movement you might see even a limb movement you might have a random breath but i can assure you the dog is gone yeah so that's what i tend to do and then i do allow them to spend more time with them if they so choose yeah? exactly exactly and you know then after that happens we'll go on and talk about yeah. in the next um section section about after everything has occurred what would follow then yeah. so that's going to be in our next episode so we this is the third so if you've got lost in our facebook or if you've got lost in our youtube there's two episodes preceding this this is the actual event. We've now got another two episodes following this about immediately post-procedure and then some of the common worries. So please join us for further episodes. Thank you, Mary. It's amazing that you give us your time to do this and we'll see you soon.